The Gallian Foundation fosters, recognizes, and rewards excellence in scientific innovation to improve the human condition. André Malraux said once in one of his novels, Une vie humaine ne vaut rien, mais rien ne vaut une vie humaine. Human life is worth nothing, but nothing is worth a human life. All these men and women are trying to save human lives. Is there anything more noble than that? The Gallian Awards Ceremony is considered the equivalent of the Oscars Night for the innovators in the labs and awards every year Best Pharmaceutical Product, Best Biotechnology Product, Best Product for Orphan Rare Diseases, Best Medical Technology, Best Digital Health Solution, Best Incubator Accelerator Equity, Best Startup. Around the globe, the Prix Galleon is considered as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for the industry mobilizing an unrivaled network of Nobel laureates and top biomedical scientists. The Galleon Foundation manages an independent, cross-functional and geographically diverse program of events and sponsorship to brand the best of the best in new medicines and diagnostics. The Prix Galleon is a welcome initiative to stimulate creative research and promote excellence. Barack Obama the Roy Vagelos Pro Bono Humanum Award for Global Health Equity is bestowed to an individual, a company, an academic institution, or a non-governmental agency that has helped to improve the human condition through the application of biopharmaceutical science to problems of developing or underserved populations worldwide. This is the right event, on the right issue, at the right time. Staging this event in Africa is a significant statement that science and innovation are needed as much here in Africa as anywhere else. I'm particularly grateful to receive this award. The awards are among the highest honors in science and commerce because they lead to improvement in the human condition. The pre Gallian Awards recognize the world's brightest minds and most innovative companies. They are a true celebration of the hard work required to produce life-changing interventions. That is what makes us optimistic about the future. Congratulations to all of you. Make a difference. Join the Gallian Foundation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kailash Swarna, and I'm coming to you from New York. I'm a managing director in Accenture's global life sciences practice, and I lead our clinical domain globally. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Gallian Foundation's Week of Biomedical Innovation webinars being held here in New York. The objective this week is really to provide additional context and background for our largest annual event of the Gallian Foundation. The award ceremony, which is to be held this Thursday in New York, in conjunction with the annual Gallian Forum of Speakers and top leading scientists and uh, experts and leaders in global health. The innovation mission of the Gallian Foundation is to improve the human condition. We've developed this webinar series to give our nominees for best pharmaceutical, best biotech, best med tech, rare and, rare and orphan diseases, and best digital solutions and best startup and accelerator award categories, greater visibility in describing their journey of medical discovery. This year's Galleon USA Awards has a record 178 nominees across seven categories from nearly 150 companies covering 15 diverse therapeutic areas, ranging from cancer, cardiology, neurosciences, to infectious diseases and very rare genetic diseases and vaccines. We'll be looking closely at the products in all these critical areas throughout this week. 
in the best biotechnology category, which is our focus today, we'll be holding three webinars due to the 17 different products that have been represented in this particular field. The awards committee have decided to arrange each of these three webinars to center in specific therapeutic areas, cancer, vaccines, and genetic, autoimmune, and chronic disorders. Our focus today in this hour with this esteemed panel is devoted to cancer. There are seven nominees, and I'd love to reference to you to the fact that we, if you have any questions, there's a link with each of the nominees' presentations that you can click on that'll allow you to ask specific questions that we can address over the course of this webinar. I'll start by introducing our seven nominees and the products that they represent from their companies today. I'll start with Dr. Megan O'Mara, who is from CGen, representing Etcetris. Dr. Lusong Lu from Beijing, representing Rokenza. Dr. Michael Vaskensels from Immunogen, representing Ella here. Dr. Jennifer Smith from Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, representing Tecveli. Dr. Eric Richards, also from, yeah, uh, excuse me, from Daiichi Sankyo, representing Enhertu. And Dr. Jordan Schechter, also from Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, representing Carvicti. Before we get started, I'd like to have a brief introduction about the company, as well as the products that they're bringing to the uh, to Galleon, as well as to the patients. Perhaps we can start by thinking about how did you actually, how did your companies, what motivated your companies to actually work in these therapeutic areas with these particular products? And how, how are these products changing the lives of patients as you see them today? The fact that these products are here today absolutely makes a huge impact in cancer patients. And perhaps, Megan, we can start with you and et cetera. If you could tell us the story of et cetera and how it got to market and how it's impacting patients, that'd be fantastic. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, you know, representing CGen and we're representing et cetera. So CGen was founded just over 25 years ago and really had a continued emphasis on the development of antibody drug conjugates, which, you know, at the time were not a big thing coming off ESMO this year, clearly, you know, more than 500 clinical trials evaluating antibody drug conjugates. But, you know, 25 years ago, we had scientists that were committed to understanding this platform. And um, as it goes, I think tried 30 different combinations, at least, of, of looking at different drug linkers and, and different antibodies. And ultimately, um, when pairing a CD30 antibody to a drug linker that's an orostatin-based drug linker called Bidotin, we were able to come up with Etcetris. And why this was exciting at the time is because um, CD30 is expressed across a variety of lymphomas, including in particular uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And Hodgkin lymphoma is a disease of young people. It impacts adolescents, young adults that have their whole lives ahead of them. Uh, many of them um, do quite well with upfront therapy with a, a concoction of chemotherapy, but some of them either never respond to that upfront regimen or go on to progress and then end up needing multiple rounds of very toxic chemotherapy and often even a bone marrow transplant. And so this was seen as a high met medical need that could be addressable with an antibody drug conjugate that's more targeted to the cancer cells and could hopefully spare some of the systemic toxicities. So um, initially, et cetera, was approved in the relapse refractory setting in um, Hodgkin lymphoma and anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, what we wanted to do was bring et cetera, into the frontline setting. And so we combined et cetera, with um, some of the backbone chemotherapy agents for upfront therapy and compared it to standard chemotherapy with a regimen called ABVD. And um, at the end of a randomized phase three study called Echelon 1, we were able to demonstrate a 41% reduction in the risk of death from Hodgkin lymphoma in the advanced um, Hodgkin lymphoma setting. Um, this was really exciting to us because it was actually the first drug regimen in 40 years for Hodgkin lymphoma to show a survival benefit. It was also the first targeted therapy approved for Hodgkin lymphoma. 
Um, we've now gone on to um, have labels in the United States for seven indications. Um, the FDA has granted us three breakthrough therapy designations. Uh, we're approved uh, with partnership with uh, Takeda in uh, more than 70 countries. And I believe we've dosed more than 113,000 patients with Etcetras worldwide. So it's been a pleasure to um, be part of this um, groundbreaking um, set of activities to try to make a, um, a difference in the lives of cancer patients. Thank you, Megan. Um, Lasong, let's let's hear the story of Woodward Cancer. Yeah, thank you. So um, actually, we were even younger when we started, and our company has a history of about thirteen years. And when we started the program, we were only three years old, less than three years old. So we were really a toddler. So the story was that the outset of the program, actually, we had the privilege uh, to engage with some of the clinicians and which allowed us to understand really there is a, still unmet medical needs in addressing B-cell malignancies. And even that was a time um, that ibrutinib began to uh, show its potential in the clinic. So what clinic clinicians observed was certain um, safety signal, uh, signals associated with ibrutinib, particularly cardiovascular findings uh, like uh, atrial fibrillation alongside uh, hypertension and hemorrhage. So we hypothesized that these might be related to some of the off-target effects um, that lead us to opt for a compound with superior selectivity. And um, more importantly, we recognize that the importance uh, of achieving sustained and durable inhibition of the target within the disease tissue compartments. We tailored the PK profile of the compound, uh, aiming to, um, to achieve complete and durable inhibition within the uh, targeted tissues, and it led to enhanced safety and efficacy uh, that was uh, supported by a number of clinical trials, uh, in particular uh, Alpine, and uh, which showed, which was the first uh, trial to show um, superior PFS in uh, among BTK inhibitors. And so the development of this product um, may, marks a significant step forward, filling a big step, a gap in the treatment of B-cell malignancies. And so our journey from the discovery phase to clinical evaluation uh, showed our commitment to go beyond the usual boundaries, delivering a solution that helps alleviating the challenges faced by those suffering from the B-cell malignancies. Thank you so much, Lusong. I mean, the fact that you're addressing um, therapy limiting toxicities, cardiotox in particular, which we see with immune checkpoint inhibitors and the like, I think that's the next frontier in terms of the areas in which we can explore. Which then takes me to Mike. I mean, great to see you again. Um, Ella here, ovarian cancer. I'm, I'm just trying to you know, wrap my head around the fact that so much unmet need, and we've started to address this in a way that even a decade ago didn't seem really possible. Love to hear about the story of where Immunogen is taking this. Sure. Likewise, uh, Kailash, uh, great to see you as well. And um, it's really terrific to um, be here as a nominee for the pre um Award in Biotech uh, with our first cancer medicine. But Immunogen's um, history uh, is somewhat reminiscent of what Megan was sharing about Seattle Genetics, but actually as it uh, goes back further in time. Um, Immunogen has a 40-year history, and um, most of, of that history was focused on really developing the foundational innovation for the uh, therapy that several of us will be talking about today with antibody drug conjugates. Um, the, um, the focus of the company for most of that history was really to work with others to develop those medicines. And uh, folks may or may not know as an example that our innovations uh, formed the backbone of Silo, which was one of the earliest uh, antibody drug conjugates along with et cetera's early approval. But several years ago, we made the strategic decision that we wanted to uh, bring forward those uh, molecules into medicines um, on our own. And uh, uh, to your point, why, why did we focus on ovarian cancer? Well, um, you know, folate receptor alpha has been a pretty well-recognized potential target in cancer dating way back to the to the 90s, but but it's been a tough target to to bring forward medicines. Uh, it's it's an unmet need 
uh, especially in the population of w women and, and patients with platinum resistant ovarian cancer. Uh, the, the incidence of about 300,000 patients worldwide translates into um, uh, still a, a mortality that's, 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 that's very high despite, uh, despite pretty aggressive um, frontline therapy for, for most patients that includes debulking surgery and, um, and platinum-based chemotherapy, but eventually most patients become resistant. And um, if one looks at available therapy and platinum-resistant disease, it's a it's a pretty dismal story up until the recent past because uh, we were relying essentially on um, legacy, uh, m for the most part, monotherapy uh, chemotherapies. And so with that backdrop, we were able to innovate with a monoclonal antibody against folate receptor alpha and then build on some of the early platform work that supported uh, Ketsilo with a novel mitansinoid payload and novel linker to bring um, mervituximab, uh, sorvanstein, uh, into the clinic about 10 years ago. Um, maybe I'll uh, circle back uh, later uh, uh, in the hour, uh, Kailash, if we have a little time to go into some of the ups and downs of that development program, because it's really quite interesting. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, the, the, the development program over the last couple of years have focused both on uh, relatively large monotherapy phase two study and then a randomized phase three study, uh, both of which have read out positively over the last um, uh, 18 months, most recently a phase three uh, trial that we will refer to as Mirasol, which randomized monotherapy I'll adhere to an investigator's choice of those available chemotherapies that we've been using for uh, well over a, a decade. And um, uh, for the most part in ovarian cancer, we think of progression-free survival of as, as an endpoint that's clinically meaningful, and that was uh, that was demonstrated in, in Mirasol. But when uh, we also saw the overall survival benefit uh, at the time of an interim analysis, uh, we realized that we had a, a groundbreaking new therapy for, for platinum-resistant ovarian cancer that we're actively extending now into the platinum-sensitive setting. So I'll pause there, and um, uh, like I said, hopefully we can circle back to some of the uh, travails that, that 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 got us to this point. Thank you, Mike. Absolutely, we will, we will get to that specifically. Um, Jordan, um, Carvecti, and Tekveli, in the sense, from Janssen's perspective, could you speak to the journey of these products in terms of the specific areas in myeloma that you're addressing, and more broadly in terms of your ethos in terms of bringing forward oncology therapeutics to the market? And I'd love to learn more about the journey of these products. I'd be happy to take the question. Thank you. Uh, so first, I, I think the company that I represent needs no introduction. Uh, Johnson Johnson is one of the largest healthcare corporations in the world. And our pharmaceutical brands, Janssen, uh, was first started in the 1960s, named after Paul Janssen, who was a, a prominent physician in Belgium. Uh, we've had a rich history in developing therapeutics for multiple myeloma, uh, beginning with Velcade in the early 2000s, uh, which was co-development with Millennium, uh, then bringing Darzalex, which is a monoclonal against CD38 in the mid-2010s, uh, uh, first approval in 2015, and now with uh, some new agents, including Carvicti, which I'll speak about, and uh, the bispecifics, which uh, my colleague Jen Smith will speak about. Uh, so take a step back. What, you know, what is myeloma? Uh, myeloma is the uh, second most common hematologic malignancy. There's about 160,000 new cases worldwide. Um, back about 25 years ago, when I was in medical school, it was really a, a terminal disease. There was no adequate treatment. And then with novel agents, Velcade included, we were able to extend the life expectancy of patients with myeloma. And now we actually talk about curative regimens in myeloma, and uh, we believe that Carvicti, as well as uh, the bispecifics, could play a large role in that. Uh, why do we need so many therapies for myeloma? Well, it, it's a complex disease. There's uh, often frequent uh, different clones, and patients often go from one therapy to another. So we need medications which target different antigens and different mechanisms of action. And we at Janssen are really committed to the treatment of patients with myeloma and looking for innovative therapy, regardless of where it comes from, whether it comes from our lab, whether it comes from academic sites, or whether it comes from uh, other uh, companies or biotechs. 
And that brings me to the story of uh, Carvicti. So I was uh, sitting in the audience in 2017 at ASCO uh, when a, a small biotech company called Nanjing Legend was presenting data for the first in human Legend 2 study, uh, 74 patients treated at four different sites in China. And the data was truly outstanding. Every single patient responded. Uh, we quickly went to go speak with the investigator, Professor Zhao, and we invited him uh, to our corporate center. And over the course of the next six months, we began diligence uh, with the company Legend and uh, wanted to create a partnership. Uh, that partnership was uh, essentially uh, concluded uh, right after ASH in 2017, and we have a worldwide development uh, uh, deal with Legend. And we began our phase 1B slash 2 study called Cartitude 1 uh, very quickly after the new year in 2018. Uh, we studied patients who had uh, multiply pretreated myeloma, including prior therapy with Velcade, prior therapy with Revlimid, and prior therapy with Darzalex. And uh, the median lines of therapy was five. And essentially, there was no reasonable comparator. There was really nothing available for patients who had progressed after so many lines of therapy. So we had a monotherapy study with Carvicti. It was a one and done uh, meaning the patient had a one-time therapy with Siltacel, a one-time therapy with CAR-T, and the results were really extraordinary. We, we actually did even better than uh, the results from Legend 2. Uh, so 98% response rate and 83% of the patients were in a stringent CR. And that's what led to the uh, approval by the US FDA for Carvicti, uh, and, and that was uh, back uh, about two years ago at this point. Uh, we continue to build on this history with uh, our first phase three study called Cartitude 4. In this study, we randomized patients to Carvicti versus a uh, triplet, uh, actually choice, choice of two triplet therapies. Uh, these were patients who had earlier line therapy, uh, one to three prior lines of treatment. And the results were just uh, published uh, in the New England Journal and then presented at the uh, conferences mid-year, uh, resulted in a hazard ratio of 0 0.26. Uh, which is uh, the lowest hazard ratio ever seen for a myeloma phase three, indicating a 74% reduction in the risk of progression or death. So uh, really tremendous results from the clinical standpoint. And, and since we've had commercial launch and hearing uh, about the uh, success of the product uh, in the US and then other countries worldwide. So uh, again, building on our tradition of developing therapeutics in myeloma, bringing Carvicti to patients, and uh, also by specifics. And if it's uh, appropriate, maybe I could turn it over to my colleague, Jen Smith, to uh, speak about uh, her experience on Tech Valley. Thank you, Jordan. And absolutely, by specifics. I mean, what a wonderful story, Jen. You know, I think you might be in mute, Jen. Sorry about that. So absolutely. Thank you, Jordan. Um, as as you mentioned, uh, Janssen is fully committed to finding curative regimens for patients with multiple myeloma. And although um, Jordan and team have raised the bar with uh, the advancements with the CAR-T space, uh, we believe that there is still room for other options. The bispecifics provide an off-the-shelf option uh, for patients uh, uh, the bispecifics, um, so Tech Bailey specifically is the first uh, bispecific approved for the treatment of triple class exposed multiple myeloma. It's a bispecific that was developed here at Janssen using the innovative science to activate the immune system by binding to CD positive, CD3 positive T cells. Uh, to the BCMA expressing myeloma cells. So we're really encouraged to have yet another uh, mechanism to target uh, this very complex disease. So more to come um, on this. I think in the next question, we'll comment on the, re the results of our Pivotal Majestic One study. Great. Thank you, Jen. And Eric, let's talk about Inheritu and an amazing collaboration that sort of led to this particular product coming to market. So. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. It's It's been an extraordinary journey at Daiichi Senko. I joined about six years ago, and the journey into oncology started a couple of years before then. Um, the company had historically been a traditional Japanese pharmaceutical company, concentrating on specialty medicine and cardiovascular, Lixiana, Almasartan. And here along comes a, uh, a technology for ADCs that uh, 
had some internal fights. I think that that not everyone necessarily believed that this should this should move forward, but there were enough people at the company that believed in it, believed in the non-clinical data that we we made it to clinic. What I think is extraordinary about this medicine is it how, how it broke certain barriers in terms of the patient populations that it's able to treat. It's proven that this kind of technology is portable, not only across antibodies, but across expression. Uh, and we've seen that with probably the, the, the most famous of the results that came out with the HER2 low DB04. Those who were at ASCO back in 2022 may recall the standing ovation. Um, showing that this patient population that was untreatable with a HER2 targeted agent before could be treated, could result in a 50% reduction in the risk of, of progression or death, a, a 36% reduction, 36 reduction in the risk of, of death and overall survival. Um, what's interesting about this is I believe how bold the company was and our partners AstraZeneca once they joined. We didn't have a lot of data to go down these paths, not not a super amount. I remember we had somewhere around 25 patients or so before going down the herd too low path. It was gutsy, it was gutsy uh, and it paid off. Uh, but it, it demonstrated that this particular technology with its linker, with the, the, um, the permeability of the payload in order to have this bystander effect as it's, it's sort of colloquially known, has the potential to expand the use of this drug beyond traditional HER2 populations. Um, we're now up to seven uh, breakthrough designations, um, and the most recent one being for tumor agnostic, which sort of blows my mind. It's uh, unlike a oncolytic driver, an NTREC, or something that hits an oncogenic driver, to have something that's hitting a protein expression, that's something on IHC, to have a tumor agnostic possibility and breakthrough is astounding. Um, I think that it's a, it's a wonderful breakthrough in technology that is going to, to help a lot of patients as we expand it into the other ADCs, not just in HER2, which is a remarkable drug. Um, so it's, it's been a pleasure watching this team um, expand the use of this drug into gastric, into HER2 mutation, non muscle lung cancer, several different uh, lines of therapy for breast cancer, and um, there's more to come. Thank you, Eric. I'm just blown away by you know, the energy that we've all seen in the last few years in particular. I mean, in this particular conversation, going from a very young Beijing starting out with just three years under their belt in terms of a product and looking at what Janssen's done with years of experience and decades of experience, what is in common is we've looked at normal modalities and by specifics, ADCs, things that we didn't think very much of a decade or so but because we lack clinical evidence. And something that you said, Eric, in terms of the fact that it was a really gutsy move to go with data from 25 patients. And what I'd love to sort of explore further is what are some of the challenges we faced in, in fact, bringing these forward within our own organizations? How did we convince the management teams that the risk was worth taking? The trials were worth running. And even though they were difficult to conduct these trials, find hard to find these patients. Mike, perhaps I can start with you in terms of the story behind uh, Ella here, in terms of how, as you originally alluded to, you got to that point. I, I thought you might, I thought you might circle back uh, uh, to, to me. Yeah, no, I think this is a, actually a terrific drug development story and a real testament to the team at Immunogen. So I, I would, I would like to spend a couple minutes um, uh, to, to share that story. So it was about 10 years ago, uh, based on what I shared earlier in terms of a, a clear a clear unmet need in platinum resistant disease and and the opportunity that folate receptor alpha offered to to think about a development program with mervatuximab um, in that space and uh, and there was a lot of excitement uh, among the GYN oncology community uh, given the paucity of, of of new drug development at that time um, in ovarian cancer and the uh, company for, especially for a, a small biotech moved quickly into phase three uh, development with a study called Forward One that was essentially very similar to design to what I summarized a bit ago with respect to Mirasol. And there was a uh, high expectation for the outcome of, of, of that study based on uh, the early uh, clinical data. I think it's fair to say that there was a uh, real surprise uh, in the, uh, community broadly when the when the trial did not meet its primary endpoint of progression-free survival. So there was a post hoc analysis undertaken, a forward one and its failure, 
And um, there was a technical error that was identified uh, in, this, in the transition from a research uh, use only biomarker to detect folate receptor alpha expression uh, to the commercial grade assay that was incorporated into the phase three. And without you know, getting into all the technical details, the, the result was simple and the impact was profound in that patients were enrolled in the forward one study uh, that had expression levels that were lower uh, than had been tested in the in the clinical development up to that point in time, essentially diluting the treatment effect of uh, merbituximab in the phase three. Now, I think I've, with you know uh, pretty much everyone on this uh, panel is uh, drug developers, and we all know that post hoc analyses of failed randomized clinical trials certainly can be provocative. They can generate critical critical hypotheses for further clinical investigation. Um, however, far too often, you know, the pragmatic, operational, and financial, and candidly, the psychological and emotional uh, impediments to overcome such a fa failure often lead to, you know, what we're familiar with, truncated development, unanswered questions, and shuttered programs. But in Imogen's case, um, this was a rigorous and clear-cut post hoc analysis the, the, the failure node, so to speak, was I mean, clearly identified. And there was real conviction, not just in immunogen, but with critical stakeholders, patients, physicians, other stakeholders who had participated in the Mervituximab program to that point in time. And there was a real recognition that, that there was a medicine here. So working with regulatory authorities, immunogen uh, took a big bet, um, uh, made some really tough choices. Uh, and essentially repeated the, 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 the pivotal uh, development of mervituximab in the two studies I referenced earlier, Sorea, uh, which is a phase two uh, single arm study in the platinum resistant population that led to accelerated approval last year, and Mirasol, uh, the phase three trial uh, with the proper uh, uh, companion diagnostic assay that led to the uh, uh, trial that read out with the clear survival advantage of Mirasol over uh, over investigative choice chemotherapy earlier this year. So it's it's to me it's a great it's a great example of tenacity, uh, perseverance, and 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 uh, and uh, the ways in which we can get sidestepped, but with uh, you know with good science and, and 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 objective analytics, we can make really good decisions. And and today we have a a, a medicine for patients that is paradigm shifting for platinum resistant disease. And uh, it's uh, rapidly becoming the standard of care. Thanks, Mike. I mean, on that note, with respect to tenacity and sort of the prevalence, or rather the, the notion that science prevails at the end of the day with enough analytical minds um, weighing in, uh, Megan, I'd like to turn to you in terms of how CGEN sees this, because you guys have sort of changed the way in which the industry sees oncology in some respects. What are, what are some of the challenges that you've seen when it comes to clinical development? The ones that I hear, upon, hear about often in oncology trials is difficult protocols, hard to find patients, uh, often difficult to keep patients in studies for a variety of reasons and the like. Beyond the obvious, what are some of the challenges that you think might exist in terms of oncology drug development? Sure. Um, I mean, definitely with the case of Etcetris, uh, it was not, I mean, people were at the time were skeptical about antibody drug conjugates. And quite frankly, when our phase one for Etcetris was ongoing, it was not the priority program within the portfolio. There were multiple bigger programs, naked antibodies and other disease spaces. But, um, you know, and this was a small, I mean, the other thing was that this was a relatively small commercial opportunity, viewed as a small commercial opportunity you know, relapse refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, although in the frontline setting advanced, or, or I think it's about 80, there's about 8,800 patients a year diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma in the relapse setting. It's a smaller number, but it's a very high unmet need. So I think there were some people at the company that felt strongly that this could be an important, you know, program for patients, important medicine for patients. And um, we ended up thinking there would be a problem with enrollment since it's a relatively rare subset, but once the responses started rolling in immediately in dose escalation, uh, it was more a challenge of demand of slots and people, you know, wanting to find breaks with patients coming up out of the woodwork to come on the study. Um, and so at the end of the day, the challenge for Etcetris was how fast can we get it to patients because it, there's nothing available in this space in the relapse setting. 
So, um, at, you know, when the company started, I think we were about 10 people 25 years ago. When Etcetras was early in its development, you know, it was still you know, was hundreds of people in the company, not thousands. Um, and so a lot of the challenge had to do with resourcing. And I think one of the lessons learned was this is an all hands on deck situation. We deprioritized other programs in the pipeline and put people on Etcetras and just went go, go, go as fast as we could. And I believe, don't quote me, but from uh, we work closely with the FDA um, on an accelerated approval path using a single arm, roughly 100 patient study um, in this case for Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, we were able to go from submission to approval in approximately 77 days, if, if my numbers are right. So I think um, this was really, I think, a, a lesson learned of tenacity and commitment to something that was unexpected and uh, the, t- the team and teamwork led to people going quickly. We, you know, we also then um, partnered with at the time Millennium uh, to CADA to just help with more global uh, development because we were such a small company at the time and all these things together, it just helped us um, get the drug to patients. And, you know, that's what we're, why we do what we do. Yeah. Thanks, Megan. I mean, a striking contrast between, a, a tiny team, all hands on deck, reprioritize efforts. I'd love to turn to Jordan and, and Jen in terms of from a much larger company, Janssen's perspective, what what always sort of comes back to me when I speak with leaders in the industry, often what I hear is that why is it that in oncology development, we're still seeing this as a heroic effort? Every drug that we're talking about today was a result of one or a handful of people getting behind it and really putting conviction in front of everything else that was, that was there. How do we make it more mainstream? How do we sort of bottle up this heroism and bring molecules to patients who need them in a more systematic way? Thoughts, Jordan and Jen? Perhaps, Jen, I'll start with you. <laughs> you're on mute. Jen, you're still mute. You're muted. Again, on mute. Sorry about that. So um, I do believe we do it in quite a systematic way, at least within our organization. Um, but it will always take those champions behind the drug. In our myeloma space, I'm sure you can imagine we have been challenged. Why do we need multiple BCMA assets? Why do we need multiple compounds in the myeloma space? Um, but due to the persistence of many people within the organization and senior leaders to help champion it, um, we were able to push that through and show the need for, for multiple assets. So um, I, I do think we have a systematic approach, um, but let me turn it to Jordan to see what he thinks. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Jen. And uh, sometimes it just comes down to one patient or one advocate for a particular product. And I'll go back to our story with uh, with Siltacel. Uh, at that point, it was known as LCAR B38M and came from uh, you know the colleagues at Legend, uh, at Nanjing Legend. And there was some, uh, I would say, skepticism about the data coming from China. This was a you know a company legend that uh, wasn't really well known. Um, we had three different rounds of diligence uh, in the centers in China. We looked at the source documentation. We interviewed patients. We interviewed the uh, nurses. We interviewed the physicians. And it was actually one U.S. patient who went to China, a patient from the University of uh, California, San Francisco. Uh, and this patient had all of the therapies uh, that a Western patient would have, went to China, received the LCAR B38M, and then came back in a complete response, minimal residual disease negative. And it was that patient's story which helped tip the balance to say that this is an incredible drug. We need to invest in legend. We need to invest in this product. And I would say larger than that, uh, you know, Janssen has a very, very rich tradition in innovation working with the Chinese market. We were one of the first Western countries to have a branch in China. This was in Xi'an in the 1960s, uh, where it was uh, very much a, a closed society in China. So again, we look for innovation wherever it comes around the world. And we've had just a tremendous collaboration to bring this product now known as Carvicti to patients worldwide, but coming from that innovation uh, first developed in the Chinese marketplace. Thanks, Jordan. Lu Song, again, picking up on that particular theme, Beijing's an amazing story in terms of collaboration across continents, in terms of how the science ultimately prevailed. I'd love to learn more about, as a young company, how you're seeing oncology drug development going forward 
uh, in the context of building on your success and, and sort of making it more reproducible. Yeah, so as we heard, so there are some very common denominators when you develop a drug. But for us, actually, we had some unique challenges when we started this journey. We were really young and uh, we were toddler, three years old. And so as you can imagine, this is a bit like stepping into a vast ocean in a very tiny boat. And so the learning curve is really, really steep. And especially when we found ourselves in a position that we need to do a head-to-head -head phase three trial against ibrutinib, so a giant in this industry and a very successful drug. So it was a massive challenge for our young team. And, uh, but it's also a very incredible learning opportunity for us. And so it turned out that what we learned throughout the ups and downs, um, throughout the process, what we found is the most important thing is really believing, um, believing in the science we're doing, believing in our team and the never, never losing sight of why we were there for this journey in the first place. So it all boils down to, to addressing the unmet medical needs and bring better treatment options and bring hope to the patients. So, so I think this is probably a lesson uh, taught us uh, uh, really a lot. And uh, so this is a journey not only about innovative science, and it's, all, it's more about the people behind it, the passion driving it. And, uh, so, and it, it's also very important to share this journey to make sure people understand the efforts and the heart that going into this and bring a new medicine from a concept to the patient's bedside. Thank you, Rusang. Eric, I mean, you know, I had the privilege of working with Ken Keller way back in the Amgen days. And one of the things I, you know, something you mentioned to me in terms of a company that had previously not worked in oncology, deciding to go into oncology and not only deciding to do that, but also having the staying power to do it and finding the right partnerships. How are you making it more systematic within, within Daichi Sankhya? What's your oncology portfolio looking like now? I mean, how do we bring the success of NHER to the more patients? I think the the answer for the organization at this point of time is to find um, to find good partners that can that can expand the use of it. I have to give the company credit to look itself in the mirror and say, can we deliver this portfolio and do it justice to deliver to the the, the most amount of patients that it, it should be serving, and realizing that there's only so much a company, only so fast a company can grow, really. Um, and that's really the the, um, the idea behind partnering with AstraZeneca. Recently, you saw the partnership, very large partnership with Merck, in order to in order to um, uh, deliver the patient the, uh, the medicine to patients. Um, the idea, though, is eventually to be able to do this more systematically in house. Uh, we have grown. Uh, Ken, speaking of Ken, will tell the story of I don't know seven eight years ago being at ASCO at a card table. That was his booth, a card table. Um, slightly different now that we've been able to demonstrate some some success. At the heart of it, though, is how do you actually get this to patients? And if we're not able to do it alone, then you partner with somebody that's able to do it with you. That's super. I mean, you know, the common theme again, there's another common theme, right? This is about belief. It's about the science. It's about not giving up. It's about individual champions in, a, in an organization. And sometimes without even having an oncology, if you will, core within the organization, finding the right partnerships. But is that what the future of oncology looks like, oncology development? How do we make sure that in, an, in a world where we are seeing further separation in terms of patients, in terms of sort of therapeutic classes, greater personalization, if you will, how do we make sure that the unmet need doesn't get so fragmented that the economics of development of oncology drugs becomes more challenging in our organizations. Part of the challenge that we deal with on a regular basis is how do you ensure that in this current environment with reimbursement challenges and the like, that we can in fact find the right, right economic story to sustain what's often a very expensive development program. Maybe Lusong, I'll start with you in terms of your philosophy going forward with Beijing in terms of one, finding the balance between ultra precision, if you will, or ultra segmentation of the market versus finding the right model for bringing clinical development uh, of the right therapeutics? Yeah, I think this is very, very good question. Very timely question, right? Because the, in the oncology field, uh, a lot of us are struggling with how to balance 
um, the uh, precision oncology and uh, really um, bring new medicine to, to, to patients, but meanwhile, really address some of the commercial challenges out there and uh, the uh, struggle um, some of the, uh, the organization had in the commercial space. But to me, I, I think there is still a, a great opportunity. And I think we are far from uh, curing cancer. And so I think what we really need is innovation and breakthroughs. And every time there is a new innovation, and such as what we experienced about 10, 12 years ago in the immune oncology. And I think th those big steps in science will bring out opportunities that will really um, innovate um, and uh, create a, a very different landscape. And I think we are on the cusp of seeing that uh, again, right? So with uh, mRNA therapeutics, the uh, personalized cancer vaccines, and uh, with the uh, uh, the degraders, the, the, the protect, as well as even some of the RNA targeted degraders. And once we use those new technologies, address some of the on targetable uh, targets out there, and uh, we can open up a space. And uh, so there are examples, quite ample examples out there recently in recent years. And uh, in the field of uh, the ADC, the uh, the KRAS uh, field. And I do think there's, uh, there's enough opportunities for us to make progress. Thank you, Lusan. Megan, I mean, in terms of what season's future holds, uh, in the sense, you're on the cusp of sort of a next chapter in terms of season's evolution. I'm just wondering, um, with more resources available to you, how do you see some of these, like what Lusong mentioned with, Proto with Protax, as well as some of the next generation technologies coming forward? Can we expect, can cancer patients accept, uh, expect further acceleration in terms of what it's going to take to bring these to market? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's a really exciting time for antibody drug conjugates, for sure. And we're committed to continuing to innovate in this space. And so, you know, thinking outside the box, you know, first, it was about well, what can we pair with ADCs to potentially eliminate the need for standard systemic chemotherapy. And um, earlier this last week at ESMO, we were able to demonstrate a near doubling of survival and progression free uh, survival with um, PADSEV plus Keytruda compared to standard chemotherapy and uh, frontline advanced bladder cancer. And so you think about that and, you know, there still remains unmet medical needs um, across the board. So we're working in the lab closely with the researchers to, you know, bring back our insights into what are, what are the needs and how can we innovate. Think about with, from an antibody drug conjugate perspective, it has to do with different mechanisms of action. Could you eliminate chemotherapy and combine multiple ADCs together? Could we create antibody drug conjugates with immune drug payloads instead of cytotoxic payloads? We think uh, same thing. Could we attach an antibody to a, a degrader and develop uh, deliver targeted therapy there? So I think um, just uh, exciting to think about opportunities for the future. There remain unmet needs despite all of our advances, and we just have to um, continue to think outside the box. Thank you, Megan. Mike, I mean, in terms of what you were describing earlier on, uh, that in some of the studies you're looking at overall survival as a, as one of one of the endpoints, I didn't think that a few years ago, 2017, I think it was when I was at ASCO, we were talking about PFS and OS in the context of uh, ovarian cancer. Like, can we actually start thinking about a world in which this becomes more routine that we're actually talking about beyond five year survival for ovarian cancer patients and potentially pancreatic cancer and some of the other areas where it's been very challenging. Yeah, I mean, I think in a nutshell, we're obligated to do that, right? And uh, maybe to tie a couple of points together, um, I think we're also obligated to drive towards precision, however that's defined in a, in a clinical or uh, biologic context and uh, do that in a way that um, ultimately translates into clinically meaningful output of uh, the measures of, of, of our drug development. And I think in, you know, with that combination, uh, we'll demonstrate the value for patients and those who uh, have to be engaged in, in, in providing access to them. And, um, uh, you know, every, every point in time where I have a notion that we've solved, uh, you know, a challenge in a particular cancer, uh, and that 
we won't be able to move the needle any further. We do. Um, and, 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 and so, um, that's, that's what the future is going to bring for th the foreseeable future in oncology. And, and I think marrying up, uh, uh, the expectation that we have for ourselves, which should be high on both the, uh, both fronts in terms of the, the, the precision of the, of the approach, but, but the translatability of that to something that, that's, that, that raises the bar clinically is, 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 is exactly what we're, what we're all about. Thank you. A question to the audience. Um, I would love to get your questions in the chat window. For example, what else should we be expecting on behalf of cancer patients uh, in terms of what we as an industry can do? How can the Gallian Foundation help advance the cause of treating unmet need in, in the oncology space? Please think about those questions, post them to the chat window for our panelists. I'd be happy to get that into the discussion. I'm going to switch, uh, switch if you will, t take a slightly different turn. We talked about some of the challenges with respect to what we face within our organization. As an industry, we're also sitting at a point in time where the convergence of data, data science, and technology has never been better. We've, we've sort of, I'm not even talking about the latest flavor of Gen AI. That's far from the discussion. But in the context of sort of the availability, and I think you know, I think Eric, you described uh, the notion of sort of having the right biomarkers, the right ability to find the patients and sort of see them through to completion. How can technology play a role? How can data technology play a role in designing better studies and allowing us to actually find or compress the timeline from initially thinking of a therapeutic solution to actually bringing them to patients? Perhaps, Megan, I can start with you and your thinking in terms of where you believe we can actually go in this direction. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, we think a lot about that, and I'm not going to get into AI and clinical development, which is a whole separate thing of, you know, having the robots write our protocols for us. But, um, you know, what one thing that we're doing right now that I'm very excited about is trying to use big data to um, understand, further understand our learnings for the Doton ADCs. We have three approved Doton ADCs and multiple other ones that are in the earlier pipeline. And we've collected a tremendous amount of clinical data, both from a safety efficacy and also, you know, PKPD perspective. So what we're trying to do is compile the data and try to understand patterns so that we can, then when we have um, new ADCs entering the clinic, um, we have a bit of an upper hand on predicting where we think we're going to land with the dose and schedule. What's the ideal dose intensity that's going to balance safety and efficacy? What are the gaps um, based on mechanisms of resistance or toxicity that we can bring back to the lab and develop next generation ADCs with a better therapeutic window? And so, um, you know, it's a it's a close partnership across from a kind of a technology perspective with IT, clinical safety, and then translational and preclinical research teams, which is really fun and exciting just to further innovate. Thanks, Megan. Jordan, I mean, the work that Najat and her team are doing at Janssen and NJ, um, you guys are leaders in this space. Love to learn more about what you're thinking or what you're doing in the context of sort of blurring the distinction or blurring the boundaries between data science and clinical science in, in your oncology drug development. Yeah, no, th thanks for the question. And uh, Najat Khan and her team have been just a tremendous asset to us in oncology in terms of drug development. Many of our therapeutics uh, come to the market with uh, somewhat limited data sets and typically phase two single arm studies. And this includes uh, Darzalex, this includes Carvicti, this includes Tecvali, and then our most recent one, Talvi, uh, all based on phase two data. So we're really reliant on real world data sets, uh, be it uh, from uh, Flatiron or, or be it from Tempest or other you know, uh, groups to try to put the data into context. Because when we look at designing a study and looking at the patients with myeloma who have exhausted all of the therapies, there really is no acceptable control arm that would offer equipoise for the patients. You know, gone are the days where you can randomize a patient to a high dose dexamethasone. Uh, we, we really have to offer some type of therapeutic benefit. And in the absence of a control group, we have to rely on real world data sets. So uh, working with Najat and her group to uh, do comparative uh, data sets between what we find in our interventional phase two and what we see in the real world is tremendously helpful. Uh, another thing we've, did, we've done to validate that real world data is design a prospective study to look mm -hmm. at how the patients are treated out there in the community with available treatment. And that serves as an excellent comparator 
versus what we've seen in our single arm data. And I think resulted in what we found was a, you know, a full approval rather than an accelerated approval specifically for Carvicti. Um, yeah. The other use of uh, you know follow-up data is to really identify long-term toxicities, which are not evident with the relatively short follow-up. So uh, all cell therapies, Carvicti included, have a 15-year obligation. So we roll over patients into long-term follow-up because you don't know all the toxicities that exist if you just have uh, you know a hundred patient data set followed by uh, you know sixteen months to identify what what's to come are there late malignancies secondary primary cancers are there late neurologic toxicities um, so that's another way we're adding to this field using available data from the real world. Thank you again, and Mike, perhaps in thirty seconds, if you can give us a sense for how you're thinking about data and the role of data in the world in the work that you're doing at Imgen. In 30 seconds, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I think that this is actually one of the um, most important potential transformational questions in terms of how we think about research and development in in our industry. And um, I, I think about it in the research context, and there's all kinds of applications that are already in play um, in the development context and in the support of the medicine in the market, which Jordan alluded to a little bit of. And then as Megan alluded to, how do you actually begin to integrate information, you know, within your organization in ways that historically was very difficult to do? Um, I've had the good fortune and, and the vantage point I had at Flatiron for several years to sort of see um, most of us uh, working through those axes in a variety of ways. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it is a substantial in terms of investment, but it, it it's one of the next frontiers. And I would absolutely encourage us all to um, think about what works the best for our organization and our needs, and then, and then push our organization to move in that direction. There's lots of technical issues that need to, 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 to get um, uh, worked through and, and, and often, just like in science, it comes down to asking the right questions to get to the right uh, solution. So it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, something that we all have to pay attention to and are. Thank you so much, Mike. And thanks for all the work that you and the Flatiron team have done. You've changed the face of, of data when it comes to what drug development looks like in oncology. Eric, I mean, in terms of the collaborations between, say, for example, Daichi and AstraZeneca, are there any particular challenges that you might give us guidance on in terms of being able to share data in a manner? I think one of the things that Jordan described in terms of studies prospectively, looking at single arm phase two studies and the like, that's the future in some respects, in terms of how we might use real world data to drive drug development. Any guidance in terms of what you might want to look for when you're looking at multiple partners in this case? I think the willingness to think of the, of the patient first and the willingness to take multiple shots on goal. Honestly, um, you know, we in terms of real world data, both AstraZeneca and, and Dijusenko have used them in the files in order to support. Um, we're both forward looking. For example, Daichi Sankyo has a digital um, innovation office that reports directly to the CEO of the company. So it's it's very, very serious where we are interested in looking how we can push those boundaries. One, to reduce operational costs. To get to your question of how do you financially support this as we get more and more precise, right? Well, you're more efficient. That's one factor. But other, you know, for example, I remember seeing a AI estimation, estimation, estimation of Flora 2 um, that was at uh, World Lung, and it was super close to the actual results, this estimation. I have to wonder if all of us will be looking at a world 15 years from now in which we base our study designs on a set of information we never thought we would. And I think as we partner, we have to be with partners that are that visionary. Thank you, Eric. And Lusong, on that particular topic, I'll give you the last word in terms of what you're thinking about the use of data science along the lines of what our other colleagues have described. Yeah, I'm a firm believer of the the, the advancement in the data science in the uh, AI uh, field because uh, cancer is a complicated disease. And uh, to me, it is... It really requires a lot of firing power. So I I think we are still at a stage that uh, a lot of the understanding is the elephant uh, and the blind man. And so 
we really need that uh, firing the uh, the firing power, the uh, computational power to help on every front. Um, in the in the clinical trial design, in the data uh, processing, biomarker, and uh, uh, as well as drug drug uh, uh, discovery and the development. So, so I think we are at a very exciting time. Thank you. Uh, I know an hour has flown by. I didn't realize that we we're almost at the end of time. Uh, I personally want to thank each one of you and your teams and your leadership in terms of what you brought to patients. As somebody who has been who's been too close, if you will, to cancer, both in my family and elsewhere, uh, for far too long, uh, I can add my personal thanks to the work that you and your teams have done and continue to do so. Um, I wish each one of you the very best tonight and tomorrow as we go through the nomination process. I'm rooting for all of you. So in that sense, hopefully we'll see you on stage or your teams on stage. I'd like to sort of maybe finish off by giving each of you uh, one final, if you will, a last word, so to speak, in terms of what you think we should look for when it comes to oncology. And from that, other, th other, th other disease areas, rare diseases, pediatric diseases, things that we haven't actually just, we've just barely started to scratch the surface. So Megan, let me start with you. Uh, I think the best is still to come. Um, no, absolutely. I, I, uh, flabbergasted at how to answer it, but their best is still to come. I'll just second that. <laughs> Jen? I think keep putting the patients first, keep innovating. And as you say, the best is yet to come. Jordan? I'll add to Jen's statement and uh, echo the words of our founder, Paul Janssen, that patients are waiting, so we will not rest. Thank you. So I'm not sure. <laughs> That Eric? sounds familiar to our, we say we're impatient for patients. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. A little bit of competition there's a good thing, right? So, <laughs> Eric. Boldness. We should be bold. Thank you. Absolutely. Lusong? My dream is to cure cancer. And I think we are still some distance away from that dream. And But I think it's our job and for everyone, for our drug developers, to bring more weapons into this this journey and this fight against cancer. Thank you. And Mike, you've done, you have the last word. Oh gosh, absolutely keep patients at the center. We have to work on access on a global basis and uh, let's keep our eye out in terms of the diagnostics because I think we're gonna be um, increasingly surprised about earlier and earlier detection based on sophisticated methods. And that's gonna begin to transform the way we think about drug development. With that, I thank each one of you so much for your time and for your dedication. And congratulations to all of your teams and you for the products that you're bringing to market. So thank you. Thank you. Good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.